and get started. Um, yeah, I, I appreciate you know the few of you guys coming here tonight. I understand that probably some of the other guys. Yeah, the faithful. Yeah, the ones who actually care about. Yeah, the ones who actually care about. Mhm. Mm yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, we can't be proud about that. Yeah. But we, but we kind of are. But no, I'm just kidding. Um. Yeah. So again, I appreciate you guys showing up here tonight on Tuesday uh, throughout your week. Um. It 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 really helps me out seeing the fellowship just between you guys uh, and, and me because you know there's gonna be some days where I, I'm I'm struggling spiritually and today was one of those days and so whenever i get to see you guys and uh, just be able to teach you guys from the word of god it encourages me and it makes me it just brings me joy that that i can't really describe so i appreciate uh, each one of you guys uh, so this week we're in session three of our men's monday night bible study this week is on a theology of god the holy spirit a theology of god the holy spirit i'm pretty sure you each have your own outline so you see uh, kind of what guideline we're going to be going over tonight. Um, but as I did last week, I kind of want to go over what our our verse here at the Men's Bible Study is. Uh, it's Titus chapter 2, verse 1, and it says, uh, As for you, speak of things that are fitting for sound doctrine. And so that's what that's the goal here, is to to speak of things and to, to, to teach things that are fitting for sound doctrine, so that we understand what we truly believe, that we understand exactly what the Bible says about certain things. It's, it's very important for us to know what we believe and why we believe it. And there's a lot of times where, especially me personally, even growing up, where we're not necessarily taught um, why we believe what we believe. We're just told to believe certain things. And so that's the goal here, that's the reason why we do the, men, uh, the men's Monday night Bible study is to try to help. It It not only helps you guys, but it helps me. I have to study for all this stuff before I can present it to you. And so I'm learning things just as you guys are learning things. And, and I'm uh, you know, growing from, from these sessions, these lessons that we're going through. So like I said, I appreciate you guys being here. Uh, it, it keeps me accountable for teaching you guys and, and to make sure that what I'm doing is according and fitting for sound doctrine. But before we get into tonight's lesson, let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, I come to you right now, and I just want to thank you so much for who you are. I just want to thank you so much for your ability to 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 indwell in us, Father, and with the Holy Spirit indwelling in us. And God, I pray that we would glorify your name here tonight. Everything that we do, I pray, God, that it would glorify your name here tonight. And also for the rest of the week, Father, as we are going to our works, uh, our workplaces, and, and, and everything that, that we do, whether it be work, recreation, or whatever it might be, God, I pray that we would, we would find our true joy in who you are. And I pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. So tonight, as I assume that you already know, we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, and we're going to be in verses 3 through 14. Verses 3 through 14. So just as we have discussed the importance of God the Son and God the Father, we have to discuss the importance of God the Holy Spirit. So remember, to, to find out anything about God, we must go to Scripture. We must go to Scripture. Scripture is perfect. It is inerrant. It is completely infallible. And so to find out anything that is true, that is factual, we have to go to Scripture. We have to go to Scripture. So we have talked about the deity of God the Son and God the Father. We have discussed the attributes and their characteristics. We have even discussed who they are in the Trinity. An example is just the names of our lessons, right? Session 1 was a theology of God the Son. Session 2 was on a theology of God the Father. So we've discussed who they are in the Trinity. But where does the Holy Spirit fit into all this? Where does the Holy Spirit fit into all this? We, we've talked a lot about God the Son and a lot about God the Father and how they correlate. I mean, even if you read in the book of John, 
the majority of the time that Jesus is speaking about any other person in the Trinity, it is talking about God. He's saying, I'm doing the will of the Father. Everything that I'm doing here is to glorify the Father. And so we, we, we kind of get this repetition that God and this uh, God uh, the Son and God the Father have this very special bond, this very special relationship, and they do, rightfully so. But the Holy Spirit also has that bond. He also has that communication and that special relationship with God, with the rest of the Trinity. For there to be a Trinity, there has to be a triune Godhead. There has to be three parts to this Godhead. So, like I said before, we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 14. And when we're going through this, I'm going to stop after a certain set of verses. A certain set of verses. Because there's certain things that we need to think about when we're reading this, these verses. right? So in verses 3 through 6, we need to have the focus in mind of God the Father. Of God the Father. And I'm going to stop for a brief moment after verse 6. And I want you guys to go back through and read it. Read it to yourself and be thinking, what does this say about God the Father? What does this say about who He is? And then verses 7 through 12, I want you to be thinking about God the Son. We're going to do the same. We're going to pause for a moment. Afterwards, I want you to read it back to yourself. Think about who, what, what this, what's these verses saying about God the Son. And then finally, we're going to end with verses 13 through 14. And we're going to be thinking about God the Spirit. God the Spirit. So let me read this to you. Starting in chapter 1, verse number 3. It said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before Him in love. He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the kind intention of His will, to the praise of the glory of His grace, which He freely bestowed on us in the Beloved. So I want you to go back through there for just a moment. Read it for yourself and think about God the Father in these verses. All right. Now I'm going to pick up in verse 7. It says, In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of His grace, which He freely bestowed, wait, wait, hold on a second, and, and, and according to the riches of His grace, which He lavished on us in all wisdom and insight. He made known to us the mystery of His will, according to His kind intention, which he purposed in him. Verse 10. With a view of an administration suitable to the fullness of the times, that is the summoning up of all things in Christ, things in the heavens and things on the earth. In him also we have obtained all inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will, to the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of His glory. Now I know I messed up a little bit back there, but again, go through these verses and have God the Son, Jesus Christ in mind when you're reading these verses to yourself and just be thinking about Him and His attributes. Alright, 
And now we're going to continue and end in verses 13 and 14. Let's be thinking about God the Spirit here. It says, In Him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you are sealed in Him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance, with a view to the redemption of God's own possession, to the praise of His glory. I'm going to give you again just a, just a moment to go back and read these verses and be thinking about God the Holy Spirit. Alright, so as I've already stated, tonight our main focus is on God the Holy Spirit. That That is the title of our session here tonight. And so we are going to be fixated on verses 13 and 14. But the reason why I wanted you guys to, to go back and, and read these verses is because these verses are very meaty. This is, this is the meat of the Bible. This is not just the milk, okay? This is not just the milk. This is, this is the meat of the Bible. And, and when you have, let's say, a steak, you have a 16-ounce sirloin sitting in front of you. You have to cut that thing up, and you have to chew it. You have to chew on it. So that's why I wanted you guys to go back through and read that for yourself. And please go back tonight or, or later on this week and continue to read these verses and think about the different attributes, the different characteristics of, of God and what He has done for us in these verses. But these, are, th these verses were the, are the meat of of the Bible. These are these are the meat of the Bible. So so I wanted you to to kind of savor that and to, to understand and to better to better read what we're talking about here tonight. So we're going to break down uh, verses 13 and 14 for just a moment and we want to describe the Holy Spirit. We're going to have a description of the Holy Spirit or the Spirit and its purpose. Right? So there's one word in front of the word spirit in these verses. What is that word? That word. There's one word in front of the word spirit in this verse. What is that word? Verse 13. It says, Sealed in him with the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. So so this spirit is holy. And, and remember last week, and even if you weren't here, we learned that the definition of holy is everything that is separate from God. Because that is... God in His essence. He is holy. That attribute is what allows all of His other attributes to be what they are. And so this description of this Spirit as being holy tells us that this Spirit is of God. This Spirit is of God. So we see this description of the Spirit. We see that it is the Holy Spirit. But what is the purpose of this Holy Spirit? This, this, this member of the Trinity. What is the purpose of of the Holy Spirit. Well, first off, we see its purpose is glory. All right, we see in verses 14, verse 12, and verse 6, they all end with praising God for his glory. They all end by praising God for his glory. So the, so the purpose, if you were to say, what is the purpose of each member of the Trinity? What is the purpose of God himself? Well, His main purpose is to be glorified. It is to be glorified. In the Bible, when Jesus is telling us why He's doing what He's doing, He says every time it's to glorify the Father. It is to glorify the Father. And when Jesus is resurrected, He is being glorified because of the Father. And when the Holy Spirit comes into us, we are glorifying God. We are glorifying God. That is our ultimate goal as believers. And that is the ultimate goal of God. God finds glory in Himself. So we are to glorify Him. And that is the purpose of the Holy Spirit. We also see, as Mitchell already said, that, that, that there is a word promise in here. We're going to get to that in just a moment. But there's, three other, there's two other words in one phrase that I want us to focus on to get to that promise. Can you guys maybe see in, in, in these verses what those words or, or a phrase is. In verses 13 and 14. 
Well, one of those words is pledge. Pledge. It says, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance. That is one purpose of the Holy Spirit. Is given as a pledge of our inheritance. Can anyone see another one in, in these verses? Well, right after that, it says, with a view of or with a view to the redemption of God's own possession. God's own possession. And there's one more word that I'm looking for here. One more phrase that I'm looking for here. It's in verse 13. Anyone guess that? Anyone tell me what that is? It says, you were sealed. You were sealed. And so we have a pledge. We are of God's own possession and we are sealed. And all of that comes together to make this promise that Mitchell was talking about. Even in the, the, the very last word of verse 13 tells us the Holy Spirit of promise. So we are promised. We are a promised people. We are part of that new covenant in Christ's blood. So we are the promised people of God. We are the promised people of God. We have this promise through Christ's covenant. When we believe in Christ, the Holy Spirit indwells in us. And He makes us a new creation. This is called regeneration. This is called regeneration. I think I made a point. Uh, that's one of your points on, on, on your list. But it is regeneration. We see the exact extent of regeneration in Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 26 through 27. And this, these verses tell us these verses tell us that God will give us a new heart and a new spirit. A new heart and a new spirit. Ezekiel chapter 36 verses 26 through 27. Read that later. Because of this regeneration, in that moment of regeneration, we begin the process of sanctification. And we see that the Holy Spirit is at work in us through sanctification. We find that Paul talks about this in, Ch in Titus chapter 3, verse 5, when he tells us that we have been washed. We have been washed and we are receiving a renewal of the Holy Spirit. We are receiving a renewal of the Holy Spirit. So when we are regenerated, when we have that new heart and that new spirit, we begin to go through the process of sanctification. When we are being renewed, Continually by this Holy Spirit. And in that time of sanctification, in that time period when we are being sanctified more and more to be like Christ, we experience this thing called perseverance. We experience perseverance. We see this in, in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, where we see Paul says, I'm sure. That he who began a good work in you will carry it out unto completion until the day of Christ. That means, people, that means that once we truly believe and trust in Christ, that we cannot lose our salvation. We cannot lose our salvation. Because if we could lose our salvation, we would. We absolutely would lose our salvation if we could. But we are in the hand of God. And nothing can pull, it, pull us from His hand. We also see that in verse 13 of what we read. We are sealed. When, we, when you think of something sealed, it is locked in. It is locked in place. It is tight. And then finally, we, we, we see... The act of glorification. The act of glorification. And as you can see just from that word, that is when we will be with Christ. That is when we will have our resurrected body. We will be glorifying God for eternity. We will be glorifying God for eternity. We, also, that we see that in, in verse 14 when it tells us that we have the pledge of inheritance. That is our pledge of inheritance. Is the glorification. We are promised to be with Him in His resurrection. We are promised to be with Him. So, 
this obedience of the Holy Spirit can lead to the Holy Spirit working in us. Working in us. And so there's five ways that the Holy Spirit is working in us. The first way is we can receive gifts, gifts, not gifts, gifts from the Holy Spirit. We, we can receive gifts from the Holy Spirit. And that we see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 7. We receive different gifts from the Holy Spirit. Now, now not everyone receives the same gift. You know, we, we see that again in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 7. And, and, and right now you might be thinking like I was thinking, well, there's a lot of men who are called to preach. Or there's a lot of men who are called to teach Sunday school. Or a lot of different uh, families that are called to be missionaries. You know, like, well, they're, they're like-minded. Well, they're like-minded, but they're in different settings. Each one has a gift from God for, for their particular situation, for their particular setting. And everyone has been given a gift from God for their current situation in ministry. And it doesn't even have to be necessarily a, a Sunday school teacher or, or a missionary or preacher. It can be your everyday walk. You know, who, who you are at work. The, those who you're sharing the gospel with. Different, different gifts, different abilities from the Holy Spirit. The second thing, the second work of the Holy Spirit that we can see is that we cannot spiritually discern anything without the Holy Spirit. We cannot spiritually discern anything without the Holy Spirit. That includes Scripture. That includes Scripture. I'm, I, I'm sure that you guys in here, in fact, I've talked to each and every one of you guys about how it is so incredibly hard to believe that, that so many people don't actually know what the Bible says. So many people do not actually know what the Bible truly says just about so many certain situations. You know, there are so many people who will not know what the Bible says. Maybe they don't have spiritual discernment. Maybe they don't have that, that ability to discern. I mean, you, we see this in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. That, that spiritual discernment, even from Scripture, comes from the Holy Spirit. So, so we cannot understand anything spiritually until the Holy Spirit allows us to understand these things. The third work of the Holy Spirit that we can see is the gospel call. The gospel call. So the gospel call, in a way, it is a work of the Holy Spirit. Ultimately, it is God the Father who draws people, who draws souls to God the Son. We see that very, very clear in John 6. But... But these people need to hear the gospel. These people have to hear the gospel to be saved. Through human proclamation, that is how people are saved. And we see that very, very clearly in Romans chapter 10, verses 14 through 17. How will they believe if they do not hear? So human proclamation is, is a work from the Holy Spirit. We are given boldness. We are, being, we are, we are given courage. And, 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 and we are given the, the right things to say from, from Scripture. But we see all of that is coming from the Holy Spirit. Alright? The fourth thing that we can see that is a work from the Holy Spirit is grace and discipline of the church. Grace and discipline of the church. Now, all the rest of these things, they might be more evident. They might be more clear to us as how the Holy Spirit is working in these ways. And we might be thinking, how, how does the Holy Spirit work in, in grace and discipline of the church? And we'll discuss more about this in our session on a theology of, of, of the church. But for an immediate answer... Let's look at Ephesians. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 22. It should be right there, right beside where we were just reading. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 22. But it says, Therefore remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision, 
by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands, remember, remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. We, we have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For He Himself is our peace, who made both groups into one. That is the church, people. That is the church. We, we are Gentiles in this room. I hope we understand that. We are Gentiles. And so for, for Christ to come and to, and to help us and to, to make us one whole group, like it spe- specifically says right here in verse 14, we need to be praising Him today for that grace in the church for that grace in the church and you can read the rest of those verses to yourself but but we need to understand that that grace comes from and is a work of the holy spirit and from jesus christ and from god the father so the the fifth work of the holy spirit that we're going to be talking about tonight is worship is worship a lot of times we don't think too much about worship. We just think that it's something that has to happen right before a sermon, you know, because that's just how we we're grown up to, to think about worship. But worship can be anywhere. Worship can be anywhere at, at any time. I mean, you think about a lot of the martyrs throughout history. A lot of them, they were worshiping God as they were being killed. They were worshiping God as they were being killed. So, so worship is the activity and the ability to glorify God with our voices and our hearts. And our hearts. A lot of time, a lot of times that happens simultaneously. I don't think I said that word right, but I still think that's how you, you know that might be how you say it. But but a lot of times that happen at the same time. So since the Holy Spirit has washed our hearts and continuously renews us in Himself, we can express. We can express our joy for Him through our voices and in our hearts. So in my personal experience, in my personal experiences, I know that my most intimate time, my most intimate times with God is when I've been struggling with sin, when I've been praying to God, please God, help me overcome this. And then I'll turn on a biblically and theologically sound song. And it will bring joy into my heart. It will bring joy into my heart about who God is and what He has done for me. Now, I'm not saying that that the Bible won't cure that. I'm not saying that that prayer won't cure that. But my most intimate times with God is when I am praising Him with my voice in song and with my heart in song. It's not just something that we have to do before a preacher preaches. We can do this in our car on the way to work. We can do this at home when we're by ourselves. We can even do this when we don't have any music playing, when we're thinking about a song that we heard that gives glory to God and brings joy to us about God. We need to be worshiping God constantly because in doing that, we have a better understanding and a better joy for who God is. And we can do this because of the power that we have in the Holy Spirit. So we are called to praise Him. And I just want to tell you guys that, that, that this, ends, this kind of ends the, the, the theology of, of the Trinity. This, this ends the, the, the uh, study, our sessions on the Trinity. But I just want to tell you guys that our studies about, about Christ, about His deity, His humanity, His personhood, and God, His attributes, His characteristics. And, and we see who the Holy Spirit is and what He does for us on a day-to-day basis. As we have studied all these things, one thing keeps coming to my mind, and I hope it keeps coming to your mind, is the importance of the Gospel. The importance of the Gospel. When we understand the attribute of God's wrath, when we understand who Jesus is in His humanity and His deity. And when we understand the power that comes to us through the Holy Spirit, 
We need to be on the front line of sharing the gospel. We need to be on the front line of sharing the gospel. I hope understanding more about who the, the, the Holy Spirit is will help you to understand that He is with you when you're sharing the gospel. When you feel that need, when you see that there's an unbeliever that you are around all the time, I pray right now that you would understand that the Holy Spirit gives you power to share the gospel. To share the gospel. As we see, the only way people can be saved is, when, is by hearing the true gospel. That needs to be on the forefront of our mind as we think about theology, as we think about doctrine. We need to understand that the gospel is the forefront of everything that we do. The gospel is the forefront of everything that we do. We have to understand that we are sinners, that God is holy, we are separate from Him, but because Christ came, He lived the perfect life, He died on the cross, taking all of our punishment, all of our wrath from God on the cross, and He rose again. And we are like Him in His resurrection. When we believe and put our faith in Him. We, we, we can have that. We can be like Christ in His resurrection. We, we can see the gospel. We can believe in the gospel. And we can be with Him in eternity forever. And the flip side is if we don't believe that. If we, tru- if, if, we, if we do not believe that or we neglect the gospel... There is a place called hell in which people will die and will spend eternity there forever. And the worst part about hell is not even the wrath of God. It is the fact that these people will be separated from God for eternity. We have to understand that. That has to be the most important thing on our mind. If Jesus is truly our treasure then the gospel has to be on the forefront of our mind. Let's pray. God, I come to you right now and I pray, I pray, oh God, that we would share the gospel. We would share the good news of your name. God, I come to you right now and I pray that we would understand who you are. We would, that we would better understand who God the Son is who God the Father is, and who God the Holy Spirit is. And by doing so, I pray, God, that that would heighten our ability to worship and praise You. I pray that we would not forget about these things as soon as we leave here tonight. I pray that we would not disregard the things that we have heard, O Father, but that we would be obedient to what You have told us to not through Your Word. I pray that that everything that has been taught here over the last three weeks would be fitting for sound doctrine, oh God. And I pray that, that, that I would continue to be obedient to you. I pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.